The following presentation was given at the Little Lakes Community Center in Hemlock, New York on September 18, 2021 and made possible by the Springwater Webster Crossing Historical Society. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, this has been a long journey and I want to kind of tell you um, a little bit about that, a little bit about myself and what I'm doing here. First of all, I'm Julie Man Warren. I live in Pennsylvania, right outside of the city of Scranton. So I'm about two and a half hours from you all. I had never heard of Springwater, never knew anything about Floyd Ingram. I'm not related in any way. And it's just a completely random chain of events that led me to here. But I am now so deeply passionate about preserving this collection. And I want to tell you why. Um, First of all, just so you know a little bit about me, let me see if I can get this right. Yes, it's working. Um, I kind of have coined this little title for myself. I call myself a history detective. Started out as a hobby when I researched my own family tree, did some genealogy, and um, I was working at the time, actually for t almost 10 years, as a baker. I owned a bakery, so I brought you all cake. I hope you stay to have a piece. Um, and that was going really well until I developed a gluten allergy. And the allergy was so bad that long before the pandemic hit, I had to wear a mask and gloves and the whole bit. And can't do that in a hot kitchen when most of my events were in the summer. So I closed the bakery and had to reinvent myself in my 40s. And so um, I thought, what else do I love to do? I love history, I love research, I love people, and I love writing. And just on a whim, I applied for a job at our local newspaper and got a job as a journalist. And once a month, my little community paper allowed me to do a history piece. And I got to go out and research stories about people that I normally would never be connected with. And that just grew, and I loved it, until um, the paper closed in 2020. And thankfully, in the middle of the pandemic, I was able to find another job. And I'm currently freelance writing for a university near my home. But during that time, even actually before that happened, I was dabbling, like I said, in history and being a history detective. And so I would research homes for people. I'd find out the history of their home. They would say, I know our house is really old when we bought it. I think it's the 1800s. We know nothing about it. I'm like, please let me research it. So I learned how to look at architectural de details, how to read deeds, how to go to my historical society and the offices down at um, the township and find out the history of a home. I researched um, the history of a cameo for a friend of mine. It was random things. Some people found love letters and I was researching the family who wrote the couple that wrote the love letters to each other. And then it began to be pictures, vintage pictures I would see online. And through that, I found a Facebook page called Camera Americana and I met um, Paul Holbrook and he was posting beautiful pictures Yes, can everybody hear me? Okay, I want to make sure. Yeah, I don't have a mic. I want to make sure my voice carries. So through my love of pictures, it led me to a website. It's on Facebook, and it's called Camera Americana, and it's still active. If you are on Facebook, please check it out. Paul Holbrook is my friend, and he runs that page. And he collects old photographs, glass negatives, um, and pictures mostly from the early 1900s. And he was posting um, all these beautiful pictures, and I decided I wanted to research them. And the first thing he told me, we were just conversing online, he lives in Ohio, I live in Pennsylvania, is you're not going to be able to find out who these people are. So, for example, I loved this girl you see here. She was just beautiful, leaning out a window. I wanted to know her story. He goes, you're never going to be able to find out. I said, tell me everything you know about them. I looked at the whole batch of pictures he purchased and I was able to figure out the family, the names, the history, and then I started a blog and blogged about them. Um, that's their house and when I zoomed in I could see the house number. And I figured out there was three kids in the family. So I went through every census record for the time period based on the clothing and found every house that had that that was, I would have a similar house number. And so then it was just a matter of time before I figured out it was that family. And I, we were able to match those pictures up with that family. Another one was this adorable little girl. As soon as I saw her, I had to know her. I wanted to know her story so badly. 
Um, and all that we knew is that that was from New Jersey, but nothing else. And Paul said, Julie, I have nothing else to give you on this. And I said, please send me every picture that you purchased that you know goes with this picture. And he called her Jersey. He called her a little Jersey because he knew she was from New Jersey. And you see this picture here. She's at a park. Well, that is like a landmark in New Jersey. And so I quickly figured out the town. Again, same thing. Three kids figured out their story. And um, pretty soon I found out exactly who that was. Her name is Shirley Buell. And um, yeah, it was just amazing. Now she had no children. She ended up not being married, but she ended up being a nurse. She ended up doing a lot of good for her community. And so when she died, her pictures were just given to whoever and sold. And so I was able to find that out. So that's a little about me. Um, if you want to read my blog and follow my blog, I'm at juliemanwarren.com. But why spring water? What led me here? Well, I told you Paul Holbrook, the man that runs Camera Americana, he collects these glass negatives. Well, after a couple years of knowing Paul, it was early 2019. It was actually um, January 2019. Um, Paul contacts me and goes, I just bought a ton of photographs, a ton of negatives from an eBay seller, and it's from one photographer in the Finger Lakes. He, like, he had clues already. And um, he says, they're all from one person, and I, I've purchased hundreds. I said, hundreds? He said, yes. And he said, they're unbelievable. They're one of the, some of the best I've ever seen. He said, do you want in? I was like, done. I said, yes. The first picture he sent me was this one. And I was, I said, I have to know who, who they are. And as Paul scanned more, as he scanned them, as he looked at them, he said, I think this guy is the photographer because there's so many of his little boy and his wife. So I think he's got to be the photographer. So he started putting those up on his page, and Douglas Morgan saw them and said, yeah, that's Floyd Ingram from Springwater. So I didn't have to do all the hard work I used to, like, to figure it out and put it with Springwater. This was another picture that I got early on. This is of Canadice Lake, and you can see Paul's, um, I mean Floyd's wife and his aunt and sister-in-law waiting right there in Canadice Lake with his little boy, Kenneth. And this road, I love it. I loved how beautiful. This is the raw scan. So what you're seeing, all of this discoloration, this is mold and damage to the glass negative. So this is the raw scan um, that Paul took. And you're going to see later how he cleaned that up. But um, I saw that view, and I went, where is this place? I want to go. Because I grew up in a city. So I saw this, and I was like, oh, my word, this is beautiful. Paul's work is unbelievable. The gift that he has given as far as um, the restoration and preservation of these photographs is, is stunning. I think Floyd Ingram, if he were alive today, would be very honored with what has happened with his photographs. Paul carefully cleans each glass negative that he receives. Most of them have a hundred years of dirt and grime on them. They've been stored in attics, basements, sheds, and they've traveled and sometimes just in flimsy cardboard boxes to get where they're going. And once they reach Paul, he carefully takes care of each one he then scans them with a very high-res scanner. He puts them into TIFF images, which are the highest he can get them. And after that, if he can't clean up everything, he uses editing software just to carefully um, make those images crisper. And you can see this one. This is one of my favorites. This is a view looking at, looking east, right, at, no, yes, looking east at Bald, Bald Hill. So you can see Mount Vernon Cemetery there. And I would guess the two lakes are on either side of the hill. Is that correct? I'm looking at my spring water people to see if I'm correct. Yeah. This view is not possible today because I went up there and tried to find it. So I think, you know, either going up Depot Road or going up 15 is where we'd be looking. See this? See this here? This would have been a road where these two barns are. Um, and it's all trees now. 
there's no way, like, I couldn't go up there and see the view that he got, that point in from God that day. But Paul did a lot of work on this particular image, and it's very crisp, and it has been blown up, and you can see it later. It's, it's in the back here somewhere, so you can see it in a large 18 by 24 format. Um, he took these pictures of um, people and life um, happening. So something that was unique about this collection, because there were a lot of people taking photographs at that time. Some of the men that were taking photographs were doing just portraits. It was a money maker. So families would come in and have their picture taken. Um, others were doing landscape shots just for picture postcards to sell. Floyd did everything. He even took pictures of pictures. So that was his way of making a copy. And it's fascinating, the stuff he would take pictures. He took pictures of livestock. He'd see a chicken. He took a gorgeous picture of a chicken. It could be up in someone's wall that likes chickens. Um, he took pictures of machinery that I think he just thought were interesting. And he took pictures of everyday life. And some of the pictures, the gatherings that were happening in Springwater, you can see the personality of people's faces. You can see what, that they had a great sense of community, of family. And I think he really captured the spirit of your town in a way that other photographers probably didn't. This is, oh, so going back, this is the restored. So what you saw was the raw image. This is Paul's restored version. There were some light bleeds, I remember. There was light bleeds on the one side that he took care of, and then he, of course, lightened it and made it crisp. And This is one that was badly damaged. This is the Snyder's, and um, this one he really wanted to say, um, I believe this is Ali Snyder. Um, and, oh no, Robinson, right? Where's, where's Joyce? Okay. Yes. Um, this is the Robinsons, but Ali Snyder's the one on the, on the, uh, left there. But this, the damage to her arm, Paul couldn't fix, but look at how good a job he did. Wow. He just did an amazing job. He couldn't, he didn't try to fake it. One thing I like is his integrity. Some people with these editing software, you've seen what they can do. They can take a head off of one person, put it on another. Paul's not doing that. Because of the integrity of the photograph, he's doing everything he can to restore the original. So he didn't have another arm to play with, so he didn't try. But he cleaned it up enough that this could be preserved possibly for their descendants and for um, just preservation of history. So a little bit about the photographer himself. Um, I absolutely love Floyd Ingram. I wish I could have known him. Um, he's fascinating and very talented and was probably smarter than what anyone realized. I think he was able to do many things. Um, he was born on October 14, 1881, right here in Spring, or right down the road in Springwater, to Mark Marchus and Nettie Ingram. And the family had been in the area for a while. Um, actually, I believe it was over in Canadice, and then they came to Springwater, but that's where he was born. He married Anna Cork on September 1st, 1909, and they had one son, Kenneth. And that's little Kenneth there with his little book. Happy little guy. He worked many jobs. So he was a stonemason. He did wallpaper and plaster repair. He was a painter, a farmer. He actually owned a bicycle repair shop for a while. And we found one picture, because that was something that was lost, I think a lot of people didn't realize, but I kept finding advertisements in the newspaper for him with his bicycle shop. I'm like, where was this bicycle shop? So Paul and I were talking, Paul Holbrook and I, and he goes, I wonder where that shop would have been. Do you think it's on, down in the four corners? Like, we were trying to figure out where he would have had his bicycle shop. Well, we zoomed in on a picture of the house, and there's a shed behind the house, and there's a sign that says bicycle shop, bicycle repair shop. So he did it right at his house, so he could keep farming. Um, he died quite unexpectedly and tragically on January 22nd, 1920. He was not that old. He left behind a seven-year-old son and his wife. Um, he had appendicitis and his appendix burst, and it was in the middle of the winter. There had been a snowstorm, I believe, the day before. All the roads were kind of blocked. It was heavy drifts. And when Anna, his wife, realized how bad it was, and the doctor came and said he needs to go now, the people of the town so loved him, they came out to clear the roads for him. Someone got a team, someone that had a heavy team to pull the sleigh because regular horses and sleigh couldn't get through. And they got him as fast as they could 
to Danceville for the surgery. Even though he did survive surgery, he died a day later. It was too late. So um, I was able to find his grave. Um, that's a picture of his headstone. And that's at Mount Vernon Cemetery, right in Springwater. And I, I put the picture of his house there in the snow. The house is still standing. And you can see the shed there on the left. That's where his place in the shop was. Where is that house located? That's on Main Avenue, right where Kellogg Road meets um, Main Street. Is that 15? Yeah, Route 15. Yeah. 15A. As it became obvious and as we were uncovering these pictures and identifying them through, um, mostly through online research, um, I realized I needed to come up here. So I drive up to Springwater for the first time, and I gotta tell you this funny story. Um, I'm a very talkative, excited person. I'm a girl that was raised in Scranton, there's lots of noise and everything, so I'm like so excited. So I'm driving super slow up Route 15 in your rural community with my phone out the window to tape everything, and people are stopping, like who is this? They can see Pennsylvania plates, they're shaking their heads. And there was an event, that I had called and spoke with Donna already on the phone, and she invited me up to a historical society event that they were having. And it was at 6 p.m. that night, but I showed up at like 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning. Like I woke up and could not wait to get up here. And it was better than Disney World to, to, to drive. Like, oh my word, it's so beautiful. It's exactly what I dreamed. Oh my goodness, there's a building that's still standing that he photographed. Oh my goodness. And I see the historical society, and there's a car there. And I'm like, oh, there's someone there. So I park my car, I come running in, and Mark Hopkins, if you know Mark, was changing light bulbs to get ready for that evening. And I come knocking at the door, and he's like, can I help you? He doesn't recognize me, he doesn't know who I am. And I'm like, bang, bang, bang on the door, like looking at him. Can I help you, miss? And I said, oh, yes, I'm here for the event tonight. He goes, you're pretty early. <laughs> I said, I know, but please let me in. And he's like, um okay, you just want to look at something real quick? I'm like, yeah. And I start taking video. He's like, what are you doing, ma'am? Like, I was so suspicious. I, I apologize a million times to Mark. Um, but I stayed and I met Donna. I met Joyce. I met Rick Rosicki. I met so many other people. I met so many of you. Um, it was just an amazing, amazing time. And through those connections... I was able to identify so many more of Floyd's pictures. Um, I could not have done it without the team there at the Historical Society. You have an amazing resource in them. The work that these people do, all volunteer, is, is a gift to, to the community. Um, and because they had already so many of Floyd's photographs that were lovingly donated by the Ingram family, they were able to sit with me, and I think we sat all day. We were there a long time until I finally had to go because I wanted to get home before dark. So I would have on my computer Paul's scanned images, and Donna and Joyce were there, and we would go picture by picture, and they would have names. There was names written on the back. And so I'd go, okay, now we know who that is. Now we know who this is. And it was just like a gold mine to be able to identify and figure out who were in the pictures and to identify buildings. So, for example, these two buildings are still standing, or they were. The top one was your old town hall, or the opera house as it was called. And I was able to run right after I left them and get a picture of it. And unfortunately, it was torn down the next year, I believe. Um, but it's things like that, like now we preserved it and we have a really nice clear picture um, that Floyd took too. Um, I'm kind of jumping around that now I'm realizing the slide should have been earlier. Um, to explain a little bit about these glass negatives, you can see um, a glass negative on display that Donna brought from her collection. Um, they are usually like a 4 by 5 size. Some of them can be as small as 2 by 3 and some as large as 8 by 10. They are glass, like the thickness of a window. And there is a gelatin film that's put on them. They are dry glass plates, so the ones that Floyd used, and we believe he used mostly um, Eastman, Kodak Eastman dry plates. And the process to develop them, there was chemicals that they would put them in. He could then print multiple things, like postcards. Or he could do photos for a family, like large cabinet cards, like if he had an 8x10. Um, 
Anyway, all of these negatives were, were put back in boxes, usually, or just stored on top of each other in a big box. And one of my questions that I wanted to know, and I'm still trying to find out the answer to, is how they got from Springwater to an eBay seller. The eBay seller is in Canada. So in the 1970s, the Ingram family sells them. They have no use for them, and they have the prints. And then they, nobody knows what happened to them, and they're showing up in Canada. So I decide I'm going to try to find out what happened to them. And I have figured all of it except for once have I'm missing one part, and I cannot wait to find out that one part. I am missing between, from whoever bought them in the late 1970s, from the Ingram family, and then went, and where they went from there. But they did end up at an antique store. They stayed together. The collection stayed together. They were not broken up. A few people purchased them here and there. But for the most part, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these last <coughs> nights, all together in boxes. And these aren't necessarily them, but this is the seller, one of the sellers that purchased them, went to a show in Boston. And this is back in early 2000s. And then from him, the eBay seller bought them. And through the whole time they're not broken up, they're buying them in a big lot. So the chances of that happening are so slim that after all these years, there might be a few that got sold here and there, but for the most part, we are talking close to a thousand images, and I can verify that they're Floyd's, have stayed together and are in Canada with a single seller. Well, as this seller in Canada is selling them on eBay, they are getting broken up. And as Paul realizes, Paul Holbrook and myself realize what's happening, and this, this guy, some of the images he's charging, he just wants to make money. He doesn't care about preserving history at all. He's selling some of them for hundreds of dollars a piece. So Paul bought everything he could. And what I call, what Paul did, I call it a rescue. He realized how special this was. He realized the history of a place, even though he had no personal connection, and I had no personal connection. So as soon as he would see another batch come up, he'd go, Julie, get on there. Can you identify any of these? Are any of these worth saving? Are there any that you don't think the historical society already has? Are there any that we could do better with? So we were being very choosy in the ones we picked because we were doing a rescue. So um, it was just... It was very interesting to follow the Providence and figure <laughs> out where they had been and keeping it together. The preservation, we talk a lot about historical preservation, right? You've heard about saving a building. People um, try to get um, maybe some dollars from the government to, to preserve a historical building, a monument. There isn't a lot out there anymore that I have seen about photography. And I'm very passionate about this since I've been doing this project. If you ever come across old photographs of your family or of anyone, if you are cleaning out a house for your Aunt Flo, if, you are, um, if you're at a garage sale, you see them, if you can, please rescue them. Um, it's somebody's history. It's some town's history. And I can't tell you, once they're gone, they're gone. We're talking way back when they didn't have videos. There's no digital files of these anywhere until digital files are created. Um, and you look at a view like this and you think, this would have been lost. We wouldn't have had it um, if it hadn't been rescued. So um, I really believe strongly in preservation of history. I'd like to talk a little bit now about uh, Floyd Ingram's photography. The equipment he used, um, I did a lot of research. I worked with um, people that um, do a lot of um, collecting of old cameras and even um, an antique um, man, a guy that deals in antiques that knew a lot about this. And so I was able to identify the top um, one as a Ricoh camera from the Rochester Optical Company and the bottom as a wide angle wizard studio camera from the Manhattan Optical Company. What I don't know is for sure how Floyd got these cameras. There was some talk that he may have been connected with the Johnson brothers and that they may have sold him a camera. That's possible, but what I found more likely is he was more connected 
to the Johnson brothers that were boat builders, and the ones that were in photography were cousins. So I, I don't know if all that's true. Um, the Johnson brothers were photographers in the area. They took a lot of great pictures. They're, they're another one that should be preserved. Um, but they ended up doing more down in Hemlock later, and then they ended up kind of dying down with their photography about the time that Floyd was picking up. So but I, they did more late, eight, late 1800s and very early 1900s, and Floyd did right up until his death in 1920. So I don't know where he got that. That top camera, I'm guessing, would have been his first camera. The bottom camera, there is a chance, there is um, a newspaper article that I found that said he purchased a photography studio and its contents um, from a man in Wayland. So it's possible that's when he purchased that, but we don't know. Last negatives are what you would imagine a film negative to be like. When you look through, you see the positive negative image and it's um, reversed there. And then you can see the picture that Paul Holbrook um, restored. That's also the picture that we chose for the cover of the book. That is Floyd there with the banjo. Something else interesting about Floyd is he played a number of instruments. He was very talented and the banjo was one of them. One of the things I've done with Floyd's pictures is been very careful in identifying that they're absolutely Floyd's. So just because an eBay seller in Canada tells us that all of the pictures are from one photographer doesn't mean I'm taking his word for it. And I had to figure out for myself, and everybody's different, um, what I was willing to stake my name on and my reputation on to say this is a Floyd Ingram photograph. So what I'd like to do is in the next few slides explain to you how I can say to you categorically that the photographs you see here tonight are Floyd's and the ones in the book are Floyd's and then you can figure out for yourself um, what you think about my reasoning. And I'd like if, if you agree with me that you then have that eye that can find a Floyd Ingram photograph. So as you go home and look at your own collection, you go, wait, I think this is a Floyd. And feel free to email me and say, is this a Floyd Ingram? So I already explained the one, um, the provenance. Um, it, and that was just a matter of knowing for certain that that came from the Ingram family. And the easy way was I connected with Ron and Sharon and I checked with them and all of the ones of their family they knew absolutely was Floyd and they had originals and so that was one. But another way was the matching tool that I used and that was mostly done with the Historical Society and also Rick Osiki. Um, this is an example of one where I saw this, I, oh actually this one was owned by the Ingrams I believe. Um, and this picture is of the Prestons, um, Mr. and Mrs. Preston and they um, post for Floyd Ingram and on the back it doesn't say that it's Floyd Ingram but it says proof and it was with the Ingram family and the glass negative was being sold as from a single photographer with hundreds of others that were Floyd's. So I am able to stake my name on that. Do you understand? I have both sides. It wasn't enough that there's just one person's, if it was just in the Ingram's collection, maybe they got it mailed to them from somebody. But it says proof. It's a, cam it's a camera, it's a photograph proof that he was showing them what he could do. And that is the glass negative. So I can then say that's a Floyd, it's a Floyd Ingram. Ooh. Another one is stamps. So he, uh, he stamped a lot of his postcards. These are three different stamps that he used. Um, and that's pretty much a given, right? If he stamped it, he's not going to stamp a picture taken by the Johnson brothers. He's not going to put his name on it. So if it has his name on it, and we have a glass negative that matches that exact image, it's a Floyd Ingram. This was the most fun. I took a handwriting analysis class. And um, I had a lot of fun studying his handwriting, and I can now spot it a mile away. Um, these are three examples that show the best markers that I look for with Floyd. He's slightly messy and trying to be neat. Um, he never can, once in a while he gets a straight line, but usually he, it curves down a little bit. His R's are really interesting. See spring water there? They look like little Y's. Um, not all of them are like that, but a lot of times they're like that. His L's, the L has a little hump, 
um, most of the time. One thing that I found every single time was his A. He kind of casts off his A. Can you see in that spring water there in the bridal, bridal veil falls? See how the A is kind of, it's not in a point. That is classic Floyd Ingram. And the other thing I noticed is a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times his N is backwards because when he's scratching that into the glass plate, he needs to do it in reverse so that it shows up and he kept forgetting and his N would be backwards. And so I can spot his handwriting pretty clearly and I've even gotten to know some other photographers in the area. So I can spot Johnson Brothers handwriting, Kuhn um, handwriting, there's a bunch of others. Um, that I was able to figure out their handwriting so I can spot it. He did not put handwriting on every photograph and he didn't stamp every photograph. But he did purchase studio equipment and one thing he had were these backdrops that people would stand behind. So for example, this young lady here, that was something where I didn't have proof that that was a Floyd Ingram because the photograph that we had, to, we did match it, there was a photograph, um, that was in the Historical Society collection, and then I have the glass negative. However, neither one said Floyd Ingram, so I was like leaning toward it. It was a pro I had this big folder that was probable. It's, it's most likely that it's Floyd, but not sure. However, I then find the same another picture with that same backdrop, and it's stamped Floyd Ingram. So now, to me, that's enough because now I know that's his backdrop. That's his. He stamped it himself. It's not someone guessing. And so that's his. Um, and because it was in the collection. So it's, it's not even enough that that one was stamped. It's that it's also at the Historical Society of the town where he lived. It was probably donated by the family. And we have the glass negative that the seller is saying is all for one. So to me, that's enough. Here's another one. You can see, I, I believe the girl on the right here is um, one that we knew for sure was a Floyd Ingram. I think I have a copy of that where he signed the back, or he stamped the back. This one was not though, but look, it's the same building. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same, and it's in the collection. It's in the same collection that they're saying is all from the same place. So then I'm able to say, okay, that one's a Floyd Ingram. And then my favorite is the furniture and props. Um, he kept using the same furniture and props, and he also photographed in the same area of his home. The light is always coming from the same direction. Um, he must have had that front room that got good light, and that's what he was using. You can see a picture of his home here on the left, and you can see this table, and you can also see the stool over there on the far left there. And so the girl sitting on the stool, I then realized that's a Floyd Ingram photograph. That's Madge Hansen, I believe, little girl. There's Floyd's son, Kenneth. They allowed boys hair to grow long until they were potty trained and grown up a little bit more. But you can see he's there with that same table. He's also um, in this office chair. And you can see it's like a metal, it's a shiny, I don't know what kind of material it is, but I'm guessing like a metal chair. And this, and we knew that was Floyd. That was a Floyd Ingram right there. This one, I didn't know, but she's in the exact same chair with the same backdrop. So I was able to identify. He used um, several of these ornate chairs, and I was able to identify one of Donna's family because it was in a, either one of these, or there's a third chair, too, that he used. That I'm guessing were furniture they had in the home. And so um, whenever these chairs, I'm looking at the pattern of the fabric, I'm looking at the carving on the handle, I'm looking or on the arms. Um, this little boy here was his nephew. Um, these are both identified as Floyd Ingrams. His nephew, Carl, um, died at the age of three, tragically. So the family went through a lot of loss in a short period of time. Um, and he's buried also up at Mount Vernon Cemetery. Um, but that's little Carl Ingram. And the wicker chairs, this wicker chair that you see, um, the girl in the middle, that was used a lot. If you see that in any photographs, um, especially with that kind of, that carpet that's there, um, the lighting coming in from, um, well, when you're looking at the picture, it's coming in from the left. Um, 
And it's not that somebody else couldn't have had that, pit, that same chair. You understand that, right? People might have also ordered the same chair. I'm looking at the lighting, I'm looking at the backdrop, and I'm looking at where was it taken. If this family was from New York City, I would say that's not a Floyd Ingram. But you're talking it's in spring water with the exact same lighting, with the same prop that he always used, and it's the same, he only took pictures from what we can tell for 20 years. It's probably Floyd Ingram. And I, I could stake my name on that. If you move that picture up, but if you went back, what does that gentleman have in his hand? Is it a playbill or? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Thank you for asking. Yeah, because these are the props, right? This is, um, they're all holding the same thing. It's one of his favorite things to do with people that were nervous, we think. Mostly women that sat for him, but he did have a gentleman holding it there. And it was a copy of Studio Light Magazine, which was a magazine put out by Kodak. And so it's not that other photographers wouldn't have done the same thing, but almost every time they're holding something, it's Studio Light Magazine. So it was just a magazine that Floyd had a subscription to. And yeah. So yeah, you asked at the perfect time. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so then I start doing the research on these. As we're identi so first was identifying them, and that took me a long time. I started in 2019. I made several trips to Springwater. I was driving up here. And um, it was a lot of fun to drive around and find the exact spot. Yeah. And so I just, I cannot tell you what it felt like. I know you drive by Bald Hill every day, but for someone who was staring at the picture, wanting to know where the hill was, looking at Google Earth and like doing everything to figure it out and plan my next trip, and then showing the picture to Donna or Joyce, oh, that's Bald Hill, and driving up here and telling me right where to go. There's a Bald Hill road, you're kidding, you know? And so I find it, and I'm weeping. I'm sitting there in the snow, on a November, December day, I forget when it was, and I'm just going, oh my word, I'm standing right where he's standing. I'm standing right where he stood. That was just, it was crazy. I told you about the town hall, and I left Donna that day, and I went over. Boom, there it was. Um, this is a neat house. This is, uh, can anyone guess where this is? It's still standing. <coughs> Ron and Sharon know, because I, I told them I was at their house when I went to go look for it. It's at the end of their street. This is at the corner of School and Mill Street. Yep, so um, as we looked at it, and I figured it out, and um, that house had um, several businesses in it, including um, a guy that gave music lessons and tuned pianos, um, the Jackmans, right? Yeah. Is yeah. Did you go back? I don't know how to go back. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. see, that also tells you how things can change. People, at, Now, think of what people have done to homes over the years. They add a deck. They add porches. They build on. So you have to look for roof lines. I was, I was looking. Someone gave me, was it, was it you guys that gave me um, CDs of um, architectural details? Oh, no, that was the Hopkins. Mark and Linda Hopkins loaned me these CDs. They had done presentations with the Historical Society, someone did, of all of the architectural details of homes in this area for Livingston County and the surrounding counties, and it's fascinating. So I watched, I ate all that up. I watched all of those, and I started looking. So I was looking for a roof line. I was looking for little details that would tell me it's the same. I'm also looking in the back for the landscape. And I know what direction we're looking at now. So as you, you think about your town, you think about where you live, whether it's here in Hemlock or down the road in Springwater, wherever you're from, you know when you're looking at certain hills and mountains, you know I'm facing west, I'm facing east. So you know where you're facing. This is the Kellogg house, and Joyce helped me because I could not find it. I drove up and down Kellogg Road. Joyce said that it was still there, so my last visit to Joyce, Joyce says, Julie, it's right down there, it's yellow. And I said, it is? It is! It's still there, so thank you, Joyce. Um, yeah, it's so neat to see these homes.
This is the Miller home. This is on Mill Street, and it has such a great history and has been well taken care of. Um, I, we have this picture. Floyd loved this house, so he took several angles. I'm just showing you one, but Floyd took this picture from every angle of this house from every angle, and that's the house today. So that's still standing. You know this building right on School Street? Yep. Yeah. And that was a school, and a neat fact that you may not know is that Floyd Ingram did the stonework for the foundation of the building. So, yep. And it's now the American Legion, right in spring water. And that's where I had my book launch, right behind that building on August 1st. So that was just, it, it felt like it came full circle for me. It was unbelievable. This, I, for, I cannot find my, I have a then and now folder, and it wasn't in there, and I couldn't find it. I might have, might be at home on a different drive, but um, I believe this is Wheaton Hill Road. Mm -hmm. Yes, Wheaton Hill Road. Um, and I, uh, but I, I say that hesitantly because so much has changed, obviously. But when you look at the grade, you look at the, um, the background there, and you look at the view, notice how the road veers so sharply. Yeah, um, to the left there. And so I, there's only one road that I know of that does that right in spring water. Now, could this have been in a different place? Yes, but when I look at that, when I look at the background and I zoom in, I really think, because you can see almost the, where Marovac goes up. And so I, to me, it's a match. And so if somebody wants, I can show you this picture zoomed in a little bit better. I would like to know for sure that it's Wheaton Hill, but I believe it is Wheaton Hill Road. This is Hemlock Lake. You can see swimmers there in the lake. And um, I was here, um, was it last year? Um, I came once. Um, no, it wasn't. It must have been the year before because it was winter winter Um And I got to visit Rick Osiki here at Little Lakes. He walked me through his history room, got to see many pictures, and I showed him this picture. And I said, you have hemlock up here. Do you think it's this end? Do you think it's the north end, not the south end? Because I don't know these lakes like you guys do. He goes, I think that's right here. There's a road that runs right along the north end. So I went down. I saw, I seriously, there's that place where you, like a boat launch area. Yep. I get out, I stood there, and I, we, I'm like, I call my, I go, Mom, Mom, I found it. I'm right here. Like, it was, it was unbelievable. I have to go back when leaves are on the tree now, trees now. I should, I should have stopped earlier. The other thing I loved researching was pe the people. So you'll see in the book, there's a whole chapter on families from Springwater area. Um, I love the history behind each person. This guy, I wanted so badly to know who he was because my father is a two-time war veteran. I sent him this picture. My dad has done a lot of history research himself, and he looked up all of the medals and the, the patches he's wearing, and he very quickly identified where he served, who he served with, and there was only one man who served there from Springwater, and his name was Renaslier Grouse. So it, it was 100% magic. There was no one else that served in that specific division. And he made it home. Good. This is the Pragle family. Love the Pragles. Um, and they actually co contacted me and sh so showed me that they have a picture with um, Iva's eyes open. But the glass negative we had, the mother has shut her eyes for a moment. And look at that cute little baby. Oh <laughs> that was their first child of 13. The mother also, every summer, took in children from the Fresh Air Fund um, from New York City and took in foster children and cared for them. She was so well-loved and respected when she died very young. I think she was in her 40s. She died suddenly. Um, it was just devastating to the whole family. But um, they are, the Pragles are still, the descendants are still living in the area, so that's really great. The Hoppa family. So we have this negative, this is the raw scan, you can see some of the damage there. Paul would then clean that up, um, but I kind of wanted you to see what it looked like. We didn't know who was in the boat, we zoomed in, we couldn't figure out. We knew it was Canada Ice Lake, because it said, but that's all we knew. And we knew it was a Floyd Ingram because of the handwriting. Yeah. Then I go to Rick Osiki's website, Hemlock and Canada Ice Lakes, 
and he's got boats, and it's the same flag, and we're looking at the people, it's the same people, it's just a different position of the boat, it's a different shot, and he says it's the Papa family. So, that was another way to match and identify. This is George Brokaw. Another fun thing that I've been doing, and again, I'm just an amateur at this, but I really love it, is looking at people's ears, the shape of their ears, nose, mouth, the position of their eyes, to identify someone who's aged a little bit and to say this is them. So we knew for sure from Donna's collection of the Historical Society that the man on the left was George Brokaw, and I believe this man is also George Brokaw, just older. And everything was matching up with him. Look at the mouth. See how his mouth turns down a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. The ear, the ears are very distinct. Yes. All of the cartilage there is very distinct. So the hairline is the same. The only thing is his eyebrows got a little thicker and he looks slightly older. And that so, happens when you get old. Yeah, it's unfortunately. Yeah, and he doesn't have jowls yet, but that's probably coming. So yeah, that's George Brokaw. The neat thing is I was just talking to Sharon about George. And um, her, the lady that lived across the street from her was uh, related to him. But I found out so many interesting things. He was the last man in the town of Springwater to have been born in a log cabin. And so, um, yeah, he just had a really interesting life. I don't think they had a lot of money, but you could tell hardworking people. Um, and he, didn't, he was also the last person to get a telephone. He didn't want a telephone. He was like... It, it made news. It was in the newspaper. George Brokaw finally has a telephone. Like, because he was like, "I'm good. I don't need it." Yeah. As I've been talking about all of this about preserving the past, I want you to know it isn't just for lone people like myself or Paul Holbrook. It's for all of you. And so, what I'd like to do in the time we have left is to really plead with you to do what you can to help preserve your history. One of the ways you can do that is by becoming a member of your local historical society. If you live in Springwater or have any interest in Springwater in the area, please see Donna afterwards and talk about becoming a member. If you've let your membership lapse and you haven't paid a fee, please renew that. You will be on their mailing list for newsletters. You'll hear about events. They offer a lot of interesting things that they do throughout the year, and now that the, hopefully the pandemic's on its way out, they're hoping to continue to do that. They have a full calendar coming up. If you're not from the Springwater area, but maybe you're down near Dansville, maybe you're up here, they have historical societies. Please support your local historical society. Volunteer, you know, get out there, just say, do you need help? Do you want me to come early, unload boxes? Praise God for people that showed up today that had a little um, trolley car. I don't know what we were calling it, Joyce. Yeah, a little hand truck to get my books out. Um, you, need, you need people, it takes a lot of people to do it. Um, I would have never been able to do this book without the help and support of the people of Springwater and the friends that I've made here. Um, it's all, it was all just a lot, it was a big team effort to get this done. I want to also take time to thank Donna and Joyce and others who um, came. I want to really thank Bonnie who is here to help us and others have helped us with Little Lakes and securing this venue. Um, this was wonderful, it worked out great and we got the working. <laughs> and I would love to hear from you personally. Um, if, I hope you can stay afterwards. I can answer some questions. Back at my table, we're selling books. They're $25 a piece. Part of the proceeds will go to support the Historical Society tonight. And we have a table of pictures and a bunch that are on display that we want you to go look at and just kind of drink in, especially because it's hard to see them on the screen or even small in the book. I want you to see them big. I want you to really look at them. Um, there's several on that table that I have not been able to identify. So if you think you know people that are in there, now oh, some of them are, but um, let me know because we're still trying to identify um, people. And of course, you can stop at my website. The book can be purchased if you aren't able to get it tonight or you know others that weren't able to make it. Um, it can be purchased locally through the Historical Society, but um, also through the Amish, Springwater Amish Shop. Um, that's on Mill Street in Springwater, and you can just check out their hours online um, or talk to Brenda Haywood about that. Or you can purchase it online from me, and I'm offering free shipping for right now um, from my website. So, Julie, you, you've done this one now. Where are you going next? <laughs>
Oh, I don't know. First of all, I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, yeah, this, it was a lot more work than I ever thought um, it would be. Um, but I think I'm still in it. I'm not done yet. Mm -hmm. So I will not be satisfied until I feel we've rescued everything we could rescue. There are still negatives out there. He still, once in a while, is putting some up for sale. Thankfully, Donna, rescued her, Donna herself rescued some. Um, others have rescued some. I know Joyce has some. Like they, we're, we're doing what we can, and we, we're going to try to bring the collection together in a way where they can be seen kind of like an online museum is what I'd like to do and connect with the Historical Society's website. So you can go right there to a link, and you can view them all. And then at events like this, we're hoping these pictures could continue to be available and the book continue to be available. Keep in mind, the book only has about 280, 285 pictures in it. I believe right now we're over 700 that we've 100% verified. And I think there are more. So I don't know what we're talking. Are we talking about 1,000 images? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, again, I'm going to be as careful as possible to vet the image, to make sure it's of spring water, to make sure it's Floyd's. Because there were other photographers. There are others out there. Um, and I don't want to take credit from them. It'd be nice to have a Johnson Brothers gallery. It'd be nice to have, you know, a, there's a lot of others that were out there. Um, but for me, I, I'm partial to Floyd. I like his work. I, I really do. I think, I think he had an eye. I think he really did, and, and so, some of these pictures are just stunning. And uh, even of the people, when you go and look at this round table back here, and you look at some of these pictures, pick up the ones of the older folk, every line of their face tells a story. I'm dying to know their life. I want to know what it was like to get up early and work on a farm and then go fall into bed. I want to know what it was like then to go to an ice cream social or... Their church, they had these massive church picnics. I don't even know if they all went to church. They didn't care. They heard there was a church picnic. They all went. And they had they had a community day. Something that was neat, I found out that they had a community day every year. And there's a picture in the book of a street race. And they're all getting ready to come down Main Street. Um, and I found news clippings that talked about Springwater had a great community day. There was a bazaar. There was this. There was that. And then it must have died off for a while, and then people like the Ingrams brought it back. And they just told me it's been a little over 20 years. They had their 20th community day, and I was there. But because of the kindness of people, phone calls with people, um, a lot of hard work on the internet, I did the best I could, and this is the result. So I hope you like it. it I have wonderful. so enjoyed talking to you all. One of the best things about Floyd Ingram's photographs is that they not only preserve the history of Springwater and neighboring communities in the early 20th century, but also give a glimpse of what life was like in small towns and agricultural communities back then. Ingram's work is a wonderful depiction of life from about 1900 to 1920. It was my pleasure to be able to prepare this presentation and an honor to write a book about Floyd Ingram's photography. I didn't realize it at the time, but when I submitted my book proposal to Arcadia Publishing in January 2020, it was one day from the 100th anniversary of Floyd Ingram's death. I would sign a contract a few weeks later, not knowing that we would face a worldwide pandemic that would make researching the photographs for the book from a distance extremely difficult and the writing process very stressful. I was so thankful for Paul Holbrook who was the major contributor of photographs for the book and who worked closely with me through what was a difficult year for both of us. Paul battled both cancer and a serious bout with COVID in the final months of my writing and launching this book. He saw the project through to the end and his commitment, strength, positive spirit and perseverance are an inspiration to me and an example to us all. I am also so thankful for many others who contributed pictures or supported me in my research. I do not have time to name them all. However, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the members of the Springwater Webster Crossing Historical Society, including President Donna Walker, 
who gave hours of her time to help me identify pictures and in reading through my rough draft of the manuscript. To Joyce O'Neill, whose knowledge of the people in the town of Springwater in the first part of the 20th century is outstanding. And to Brenda Haywood and Mark and Linda Hopkins for their help and hospitality. A special thank you to Ron and Sharon Ingram for their support of this project and invaluable contribution of Floyd's work. Thank you to Doug Morgan, who first identified Paul Holbrook's glass negatives as being from Springwater and gave hours of his time to help identify pictures and fact check portions of my manuscript. He is an exceptional historian. A special thank you to the Livingston County Historian's Office for their help with my research. And a heartfelt thank you to Rick Osiki, who was instrumental in my being able to identify many of Floyd Ingram's pictures. Rick's work and his website at hemlockincanadicelakes.com is a phenomenal resource to anyone who's doing historical research in the area. Rick's kindness to me and support of this project means more than I can say. Thank you to everyone who contributed to the book, supported me along the way, and welcomed me so warmly to Springwater. In a day and age where so much divides people, it was wonderful to be united with you all around this project. I think the spirit of Floyd Ingram's Springwater lives on in all of you and the Western Finger Lakes region. I encourage you to continue to support events that build community. History is a great unifier. Let's continue to work together to preserve the past for generations.